So um, what I'd like today is, uh, this is a project that's just started. <laughs> <laughs> but did, we did find out about it in January, and they said, I think you have a project, if there's money in, in August, we'll let you know. But we did make a little headway, but also um, uh, Quan Chi Zhang, who's really, uh, it's the primary, and this is all his work. We had a previous peer project that this project that we're embarking on now really builds on. So I'll spend about two thirds of the time today talking about the, pre the results of that previous project, which really never got, I think, aired because of COVID and so forth and then kind of show what, how we're taking that further. So again, Quanchi is a key person. He did his PhD on a lot of this work, but then is now a, a, on the staff as a postdoc with the Sims Center. And also Peter Lee, a new PhD student who's just started that's uh, kind of helped. We have done some work on it this summer. Um, so let's see. Hmm. Why can't the modern is that going forward and back? Okay, let's see if you can get it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and just to position this, it really fits in nicely with uh, kind of what Jack Baker started with today, doing the transportation analysis. Here we're going to focus on the bridge part. And then it also relates to what Barbara Sniti talked about, some of the fragility modeling they, they did of bridges. And I should point out that the, the basic theme of this is developing surrogate models to get a higher prediction of bridge damage based on detailed models. So it builds into the seismic risk analysis, but it's not looking at the transportation, but it's looking at geographically distributed ground motions and bridges and looking at bridge design modeling parameters, a little bit of bridge inventory data, regional ground motion hazard, um, and then really looking at bridge response and damage assessment. So the outline for to spend some of the time talking about the previous work we did, um, which was really focused, and this was a project we did with uh, Dave Sanders and Mohammed Mustafa at uh, University of Nevada, Reno, looking at uh, ground motion duration effects on bridges. I'm gonna talk about the computational part that we worked on, and specifically the part that really relates to this using a surrogate model to kind of, as a, as a better way to get a kind of high fidelity representation with a simpler model of the damage. And then we'll, we'll shift into a little bit how we're extending that. So just a, a brief recap of kind of what's been done before. So this is again, the work of Quanchi. Um, and this even predates some of the, the peer project, but he developed a, uh, a model to, to basically an open, it's been implemented in open seas. You could find the documentation and so forth online um, to simulate reinforced concrete uh, members, but to pick up bar fracture, because if we want to look at duration effects and cyclic loading effects, we felt it was important to pick up our fracture. Um, so I won't go through the details of that model there, except to say it has a number of modeling parameters and it picks up the effect of strains, uh, local buckling, and then how that proceeds into fracture. Um, but it's been, the parameters for that have been calibrated against uh, about 200 um, cyclic reinforcing bar tests. These were done by Wasim Ghanoum as part of uh, work he's been doing on looking at high strength rebar down at the University of Texas. Also then calibrated to 46 cyclic uh, uh, RC member tests. And then we did validation with six uh, shake table tests. And these were the shake table tests that were done as part of peer projects at University of Nevada, Reno. And just the graphic on the right shows how we're kind of picking up under cyclic loading or the shake table test, the fracture occurrence. Uh, we could build those into bridge models. And so we looked at, in this case here, looking at a single peer kind of two span model and looking at duration effects. And this is something uh, uh, we've done previously and others is to kind of tease out what's the duration effect, take a couple of ground motions and find ones that have similar intensity and similar spectral shape. And so that's shown upright but one of whom has much longer duration than the other. So in this case, there's one with a five second significant duration, one with 49 seconds, that's five to 75% significant duration. Um, and then just shown in the, in the graphic on the lower right is something if you do a kind of a shaking of these things that you'll notice under the short duration, you have fewer cycles, you're not getting bar fracture. Under the long duration, you're picking up bar fractures. And as you start to scale up these ground motions, you're going to pick up more collapses, of course, when the, when the fracture is included. OK, so now shifting into the area of kind of surrogate models or approximate or substitute models. Um, one that we've developed, and this was work with Jack Baker and uh, Quanchi and also 
former student, uh, Reagan Chandra Mullen, we call it uh, site-specific adjustment for incremental dynamic analysis. When you do an incremental dynamic analysis, you pick one set of ground motions to scale them up till collapse. We know that that does not represent the, the site-specific characteristics, which when you get to more extreme earthquakes, the spectral shape is going to change. Okay, so you can either do a multi-stripe analysis where you use different ground motions at each intensity level, but if you want to do an eye analysis, another way is to adjust the results um, as a function of features of the ground motion you don't pick up. Um, so in this case, the, so we capture spectral intensity as part of the IDA, but the two features that we want to capture with this uh, adjustment to it is spectral shape, and that's kind of demonstrated by the graphic in the middle there. This goes back to even Jack Baker's PhD work on looking at epsilon and spectral shape, and a, and a metric called SA ratio that kind of takes into account the difference between the over there, where the one that's uh, the one that's shown in the yellowish co color will be more damaging than the other one, and also significant duration. Uh, and the little graphics on the left just show that if you kind of, from a hazard analysis, if you map the characteristic um, SA ratio and duration, you can see how they vary. So we want to kind of layer that into the assessment of damage in addition to spectral acceleration that's picked up through the IDA analysis. Now, to do an IDA analysis, you have to pick a set of ground motions. For training this surrogate model, um, we pick a grid set of ground motions. And that is we specifically, we're gonna scale them up for intensity, but what we wanna do is we have a, wanna have a broad spectrum of this SA ratio reflecting the spectral shape and also duration. So as shown in the graphic on the lower left, we kind of have a range of SA ratios we're looking at for duration. And we looked at different numbers of ground motions. We came, a sweet spot was a seven by seven grid where we're trying to find ground motions out of the pure ground motion database that have that range of different spectral shapes and different durations, and that's what we're going to use to train these models. Okay, so we could take those group of ground motions, take our bridge model, do an incremental dynamic analysis, and that's the graphic shown up on the right where we're plotting spectral acceleration. In this case, we're not plotting drift, we're plotting maximum curvature, which you could then associate different curvatures with different damage states. This goes to work, some of the work that Reggie DeRoche and Jenny Pageant have done looking at curvature damage states. In our case, we could also track when does the first rebar rupture, or you could take it all the way to collapse. So these would be different limit states that you interrogate with an IDA analysis. But the statistics that we get directly out of this analysis don't represent the hazard that you might have as a site. So the chef IDA uses basically a response surface technique, which I shown on the left slide here. And if we look at one limit state, this being the limit state of collapse, what's the SA value that gives you collapse? that if you plot all the points, those uh, 49 uh, ground motions that we have as a function of SA ratio and as a function of duration, and then if you fit a log linear um, plot through those, basically a regression, you could get this response surface that's gonna allow you to adjust the collapse point as a fo function of the spectral shape and of the ground motion duration. Now what's shown on the upper right on this plot the jagged, the empirical CDF that's shown there, that's the data coming right out of the IDA analysis. And then the colored plots that are shown next to it are going to be when we adjust that IDA curve for a few different sites. So there's three sites in San Francisco. So the site, and, and these are on three different soil classes. So each of those is gonna have a different spectral shape associated with it and the duration depending on the governing earthquake. We also picked a site, class C uh, in LA, and you can see how for each of those using this chef IDA, we take the IDA results and we predict the collapse fragility taking into account the site specific characteristics of spectral shape and duration. What's shown in the lower right is just how that we've taken this sort of model prediction and we've done a multi-stripe analysis that is a more laborious one with multiple ground motions as a check that this surrogate model is giving an accurate estimate of the collapse. Um, so then we took for this uh, part of the peer project, the previous one, uh, we could use this certain model to take one bridge and then we could look at it and make predictions of it collapse as a function of different locations with different say, ground motion duration. We also wanted to build in some design parameters. So these were additional parameters that were brought into the surrogate model. So two of them we looked at would be the strength of a column. 
And in bridge design terminology, we'd look at the deformation, the ductility demand in a, in a, in a kind of displacement-based analysis. That's kind of how you get a measure of the strength of the column as a function of the column size, reinforcing bars, and so forth. We also looked at a measure of where you could change ductility is with the tie spacing because it inhibits local buckling and then it's gonna give the column more ductility being less prone to fracture. So we trained this chef Ida model to not only adjust for the ground motion parameters, those two, but also for these two structural parameters. And then we could come up with a response surface. Now it's 4D, so we could only plot 2D at a time, but you can see it's that same log linear plot, a little bit small shown on the right, where some of the parameters are associated with the site-specific characteristics, and then the other parameters are these design parameters that I mentioned. Okay, so this is, allows us to then take a bridge and put it in a certain location and build some structural properties and to get the site-specific ground motion characteristics. Now, thinking about uh, uh, how you might apply this in a design situation. If we take that response surface model that's shown, and if we had, and this is say the one for, I guess in this case, it's, uh, we're looking at, you could look at any of the limit states collapse or first bar fracture. And if you had a performance target, meaning that you didn't want to have fracture up to a certain level of ground shaking intensity. So you could put that, what's shown on the left is you take a horizontal plane, slice it through that response surface, and then we could translate that to the picture that's shown on the right. And what this is showing is the safe zone, if you will, shown on the right is in the light green area. So that's going to be one that satisfies the uh, performance target for whatever ground motion you establish that to be. And the two axes that are shown there are what's the required strength of the column and what's the required tie space in the ductility. And we picked this site for Eugene, Oregon, which the seismic hazard analysis with the subduction earthquake governing the hazard there, it's gonna have very long duration. Well, if you take the, the current design philosophy, you might have uh, where the uh, ductility ratio would be four, and you could have a bar spacing and S over D ratio goes out to six. So you would design that column, a 42 inch column, shown by the highlighted in yellow there, that's outside of the safe region. So this would show, for example, that if you, had design charts like this to take into account this additional effect of ground motion duration and the spectral shape for a site in Oregon that you'd either have to kind of reduce the strength, make the column stronger, reduce the displacement or ductility demand, or you'd, and or you'd have to reduce the tie space. And then you could take these sort of kind of design concepts and you could look at different sites all over the, the West and Pacific Northwest and uh, so those are the little cities that are shown there, showing that if you're in areas like Los Angeles, where we typically have shorter duration, you know, near fault earthquakes, um, the design uh, guidelines are fine. But when you go to some of these areas, such that are shown on the right, Eugene, Oregon, Anchorage, Alaska, where you're more affected by a subduction zone, these would be ones where you may want to tighten up design requirements to take care of duration effect. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what we had worked on previously. We want to now extend those concepts a little bit further to look at more design features and also to look at a more robust type of surrogate model. Uh, I started that a few minutes before I started though. Um, so uh, because we want to we wanted to extend this to bridge highway networks. We actually want to put in more design properties. I showed two properties there, tie spacing and strength. If you want to put in additional ones, that Chef Ida surrogate model, when you try to fit a surface to it, it, it can't handle those large dimensions well. So another type of surrogate model is this probabilistic learning on manifolds. This is really something that came out of the work in the Sim Center, working with uh, actually Sanjay Gabinjay, kind of you know, found this in the literature, introduced it, got us working on it, and Quan Chi Zhang, we've actually kind of implemented it. This is really a surrogate model that's really data-driven. We're not fitting any kind of surface. There's no parametric function that we're fitting to it. We're kind of keeping the data in the surrogate model as a way to cleverly interrogate the data very quickly when you want to get an estimate. So you can imagine this n-dimensional space, you don't know, shape that has, but you're just going to be able to interrogate that model quickly. Um, so it's a non-parametric model. You have no prescribed distributions that are built into it that you have in some Gaussian process models. An important thing, it preserves correlation between calculated responses, and I'll show that in a minute. 
and it could pick up higher and higher dimensions. So we've done some work previously looking at, say, as an example here, a 12-story building, uh, kind of with this lumped mass and spring system. Here we're going to look at various design parameters, what one might be the floor weight of the building. What's shown in the little uh, distribution graphic there is you might have estimates of what the probabilistic distribution of floor weights are, but we're going to train this model similar to what we did with the uh, ground motions. We're going to pick a whole bunch of weights to train the model, and then what we could do is when we want to apply the model for a certain distribution of, say, floor weights or any other structural property, we could build that into when we want to get an estimate out of that model. Um, and so what's shown in these graphics here, there's a lot of details, but it, the basic point is that we train the model on a much broader set of parameters. And then when we want to apply the model, be it a site-specific ground motion or being at a specific set of design constraints, the strength or the weight of the building, we could kind of match the distribution um, that we, we want to interrogate in the model and get predictions of response. And the other thing I mentioned that's important with this is that it preserves correlation between different response quantities. In the chef Ida type model I showed before, you could train a model on collapse or you could train a model on first rebar fracture, and they're done kind of independently. In this model, it can pick up correlation. So for example, we could not just estimate the peak drift in the building, but actually get the story drift ratios of the height of the building. So it's really taking the place of, the, uh, uh, of the, doing a full-blown analysis. And so we started then applying this uh, plum model to looking at bridges coming from different bridge properties, different site effects. And then we're doing some validation of the IDA analysis using the plum model versus the, the uh, multi-stripe analysis. So the concept of plum, you apply it much like the chef IDA, but it's just a more robust surrogate model. Um, so in terms of bridge modelers, and this follows some of the work that uh, Barbara showed before, we're kind of looking at imagining that you have these archetype bridges that could have different numbers of spans, different number of column bends, different design areas, and from the design areas, different uh, parameters in terms of the strength, the types, and the size of rebar. So you could maybe have 600 samples of different bridges with these parameters, and we would train the surrogate model over that space such that if you want to look at a transportation network based on the number of spans that you apply to the bridge inventory, you could then apply this model and get estimates of the response. So if you will, a higher resolution fragility function than the typical ones we have in hazards. And just a, a quick application, we took uh, just looking at one realization, one bridge archetype, one configuration. Uh, we did an IDA analysis, that's the graphic shown in the middle. Um, the plum model actually takes that IDA data, the training data, and then it statistically sprinkles a lot more data in between it so that when it's sampling in this space, it kind of, it's not a sparse data set anymore. It kind of fills it in. So that's part of the plum methodology. Um, and then what's shown in this slide here is just the, we've taken, uh, put that bridge in one particular site in Bakersfield. We've taken a, a set of ground motions, a multi-stripe multi analysis, but we'll look at one stripe to validate it. And lo and behold, we're getting good agreement with this one. So we think this has a lot of promise to kind of, you know, much like Jack started the day by showing training a, a neural net to represent the transportation system. Here we're gonna train using this plum model to represent bridge behavior with detailed finite element models, open seas models, but then be able to represent this with the surrogate models so you can kind of these overall transportation uh, distributed systems. And finally, we are building this, this plum model is already built in and we're continuing to enhance it in some of the Sim Center tools, CoFam and EEUQ that look at specific structures one at a time, and then R2D to build it in a network analysis. So we want to build the surrogate model into that, whereby we could kind of, if you will, combine the sort of studies Jack showed at the beginning or Barbaros with kind of this surrogate model, kind of bring these things all together. Um, and my pitch for Sim Center, my other job these days is co-directing it with Sanjay Gavinjay is to, uh, if you haven't taken a look at that, the tools are really getting robust there, in particular, the three that are highlighted here. I encourage you to take a look at those. If you have questions on how your research could use it, reach out to us. Okay, thank you.